YouTube, this is Evie. Welcome back to my channel and today I have another video for you all. Today we are going to be talking about vetting potential play partners and relationships in BDSM. This topic is inspired by a question I received on Tumblr, which if you guys want to ask me questions, that is the best place to do it, although I can't get to everybody. Somebody had asked me on there, I've heard you talk a lot about in your previous videos, vetting, but how do you actually do it and what does it look like? And I thought that today would be a great chance to go over that topic. Now, for those of you who have not seen my previous videos talking about negotiation, aftercare, what to expect at your first dungeon, how to approach potential play partners, etc., I do highly recommend you watch those videos. I will link in the description down below a playlist, that's my BDSM 101 playlist that covers all those topics, but for those of you who are not familiar or maybe just want a quick summary, I'm going to go over why vetting is important and why we do it in BDSM. I'm going to preface this by saying vetting is not necessarily a requirement. I know everybody in BDSM has different risk profiles. They have different things they're comfortable with. You are potentially going into this with an existing partner and don't really need to vet them because, hey, you've already been dating for three years, so you're pretty sure this person is not an axe murderer. But for those of you who are new to BDSM, are just getting started in the local community, and those of you who are transitioning from online relationships to real life relationships, and you can't always Always guarantee that people are who they say they are this is something that I would highly 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 suggest that you look into doing because it's going to kind of be your first defense against anything potentially going wrong in a scene and it's just generally a good practice to get into and I think as well when we get started in BDSM and we're translating our mind from thinking about BDSM in the vanilla sense to like the way that kinksters actually think about it, we can come out of it feeling like, well, BDSM is fine, and it's perfectly safe, and consent, and like, I never heard about anything bad happening before, because compared to the perspective a lot of vanillas have, which is simultaneously that BDSM is extremely dangerous, and also that BDSM is just a sex thing, to the actual kink perspective, which is like, in BDSM, we care so much about consent and safe words, and we have all these like safety valves built into our play and all that great stuff. But that doesn't catch everything, and it's not just BDSM is going to be safe or BDSM is a completely like dangerous thing. There's some gray area there, and obviously it's going to depend on who you play with, how safe your scenes actually are. As well, vetting is not necessarily just about making sure that somebody is safe to play with, it's also about making sure that you're actually compatible for play. That is really what I think this is about more so than making sure that somebody is safe. Obviously, that everybody goes into BDSM with the best intentions, but you're really not all that likely to be axe murdered if you take the right precautions like playing in public together for the first time, etc. Uh, and I will cover those as well when I go over this video, but really, this is about making sure that you find somebody that you're actually a good fit with before you move on to actually negotiating and progressing into a scene or into a relationship. I think about it like a job application. Vetting is the point in time where you're asking for a resume and then actually reviewing their qualifications, uh, their skill set, and what they're actually looking for in a job. And I want to emphasize here that I would not encourage thinking about potential partners like need fulfillment machines or just ways to get your masochism out of whatever. That's not what I'm trying to do here, but I think this is a helpful analogy for those of you who are in the working world to just kind of uh, explain how this whole process works because in BDSM, there is more risk, obviously, but people are also looking for very specific things and can have very different understandings of how different things are supposed to be done in play, what they want out of relationships, and what they actually do in scenes. So it's all just about making sure that the two of you or however many people you're potentially looking at are actually going to have you know, something that fits together. If you are somebody who is seeking out a DDLG relationship that you want to be monogamous and 
24-7 and not really super bratty but a little bit masochistic, you are going to obviously not be super compatible with somebody who is a dominant, who has 30 years of experience in heavy bondage and really, really heavy sadism, but doesn't want to be called daddy and doesn't really like any of that fluffy stuff. You may not really be a great fit. So anyways, that's why we vet people. But how do you actually do it? And I actually have a couple different methods for this that I recommend doing, especially if you do multiple of these together. I find that to be the most effective. And I'll kind of be sprinkling in some of my own personal experience here. But the first thing that I recommend is actually watching somebody play, particularly at a public play party. This is going to be very helpful for you if you are looking to just do pick a play at a dungeon, want to demo something, or are really just looking for something casual because this is maybe not going to give you a complete sense of what this person is like, but you'll at least be able to understand the basics of how they conduct themselves in a scene. And that could be everything from how they do aftercare, how they negotiate, how they respect safe words, to what is their actual flow of play like? What's their energy like? What sort of things do they say? How do they act? How do they dress? What is their expectation around body touching and all of that? And keep in mind, everybody's energy is going to be different partner to partner and scene to scene. But generally speaking, if somebody is playing and having a good time and is being very enthusiastic, you will have an understanding of, okay, you know, this is what this person's energy is like and kind of just get a very generalized view of how they play. But just knowing that one scene and one person don't necessarily translate to how they play all the time or with all people. They could potentially uh, be having an experience that is very unique to just that one partner that they don't take anywhere else. But that is why it's important if you are going to watch them play that you ask permission first. You don't want to be like, hey, I'm watching you play and like get really close and just creepy. Don't do that. Please, please don't YouTube. Don't, don't do what I just did when you watch people do scenes. Don't be creepy about it. Watch from a respectful distance and don't interact with the scene really unless you have given permission to do so by both parties involved. That's really important here. I wanna emphasize this. If you're going to watch a scene, be respectful in terms of dif distance, but also make sure not just with the top, but also with the submissive that they're comfortable with you watching in terms of, hey, I'd like to play with this potential person. Do you mind if I watch your scene? And if you're playing at a public dungeon, I would say, 95% of the time, they're gonna be okay with that as long as you do respectfully. Occasionally, people are gonna be doing scenes in public where it's not really the in public part that's important. They're literally just there to use a specific piece of equipment and they really don't wanna be bothered or watched. And that is totally okay and acceptable. Again, I would encourage this being done at a public dungeon, not at a house party. And the reason for that is when you are at a house party as opposed to a dungeon, you're looking at a potential situation that's very loud, so you're not gonna be able to hear much, that's dark, so you're not gonna be able to see much, and that is just generally crowded, you have potential issues around substance abuse or just people being drunk or being obnoxious or maybe not being on their best behavior per se. And also, you want to do this in the same sort of situation that you would want to be playing in, which ideally the first time would be in a public dungeon. Now, this is actually how I vetted Mr. Tex the first time I played with him. Uh, for those of you who don't know, that is my dom. But the first time that I met him was actually at a party and I never seen him play before. It's actually my first time in that area's dungeon ever. I didn't know anybody who was there except for later I found out Christopher was there, but I didn't realize he was there. So we had never met anyway, so it didn't really matter. But uh, anyways, um, I was there and I had a conversation with him for probably like at least an hour before I, I wanted to watch him do a scene. So I got to know him a little bit first just as a human and as a person. And that's really important as well. Like if you're gonna do the thing where you're like, hey, I wanna watch you play, let's play together. If you're gonna do that, first of all, don't do that. Again, don't do that. 
but you need to make sure that you take the time to actually talk to somebody and treat them as a real life human being and not just a dom or a sub to fulfill your needs. And actually, briefly, let me mention here, so it is very, very clear, although hopefully you've seen my videos before, I hope you know that this is generally the case, Vetting is not something that's exclusive to doms and it's not something that's exclusive to bottoms or submissives. It is for everybody to use. It is for everybody in the kink universe to take advantage of doing. Because if you are a dominant and you want to be able to play with a submissive and they say that they have tons of experience doing rope bondage and golly, they love just doing uh, like a single tie being suspended only from the chest and then you do that scene with them and then they start screaming as soon as you lift them up in the air that hey they can't breathe and their back hurts oops turns out they've never actually done this before and maybe if you'd asked around you would have figured that out uh anyways that also is definitely very much true for submissives looking for dominance again like i've, I've mentioned before previously there are tons of situations where you as a submissive are not going to be compatible with the dominant if you're looking for a dominant to do like a really hot knife play scene with you you just want to have like a knife ran all over your body you want him to like a uh, carve sir in your back with very like serpentine letters and you want it to be all fancy and beautiful and they say oh yeah i can do that and then they pull out a knife and it's not sharp at all and it's got clearly not been cleaned and um they just don't know how to act in a scene and it's really awkward and you don't know what to do and the sensation is awful because the knife is like pulling on your skin instead of gliding over it. Oh no, it turns out they've never used a knife on another person before, ah! Like, that is when vetting is very, very useful. But anyways, other methods for vetting. The next method I recommend doing is when you're sort of moving up the ladder from casual play partner and pick up play to potentially a more serious scene all the way up to a full on BDSM relationship and that is ask for references directly. Going back to the job application analogy, usually on resumes a, a potential position will ask you for references because they want to make sure that you are actually who you say you are, you have the skills that you say that you have, and that you actually have the long-term goals, interests, etc. that you list on your resume because, hey, you can say anything you want over paper or in an email or in a text message, but when it really comes down to it, you may or may not have those skills and maybe you kind of fibbed a little bit that you've been doing this for five years and really you've only been doing it for two but five just sounds so much better anyways that can happen and that's why it's important to ask for references because they will be able to tell you you know is this person who they are is this person somebody who's actually good to play with what was your experience like etc Keep in mind though, most people will only give you references to people they've had good experiences with and they could be potentially ignoring all of those dozen people who have issued consent violations against them in Florida and they've moved to Michigan and changed their name since then. There are some definite holes to this particular method, but it is again a way to get a very general sense of if somebody is a good play partner or not and is best combined with other methods and just using your own intuition. Namely, this is best, I would say, for eliminating people who don't have any references and are very defensive about it or who are like, I don't really need to give you references. That's dumb. Why don't we just like play together? Like. That's a big red flag because typically that means they are hiding something. Somebody who is a good play partner and is a good dominant is usually more than happy to, happy to provide experience and references or even tell you about actual specific scenes they've done with people and also the same way for submissives. If they are a decent submissive, normally they have had some previous experiences for them that have been positive that they are more than happy to share. The last method is one that I think is really helpful if you are getting involved in the local community and you have this as a potential resource and that is asking other people in the community about this person with some exceptions for communities that are particular, particularly catty and prone to gossip. This is the best way to get an accurate picture of what this person is like from multiple perspectives. 
what you can do here is just say, hey, I'm thinking about playing with this person. Do you know anything about them? Have you seen them play before? Have you played with them before? So on and so forth. And usually, unless they are completely new, at least one person in your community will have probably seen them play before or know somebody who has or know the names of one of their play partners or something along those lines. And typically, you're going to get a lot more honest response here because People in the BDSM community generally want to keep each other safe in terms of, yeah, they seem like a pretty good person. I haven't really played with them before, but I also haven't heard anything bad. Or, yeah, I know that person. Uh, So-and-so plays with them all the time. I think you should probably ask them about their experience. And that is how you get a really good picture of who they are. Again, because of potential gossip, cattiness and maybe potentially somebody's not been a part of the scene for very long, this is definitely not a foolproof method. And that is basically what I would say for Al, how to actually do these things. Um, there are a few other parts of this that I would like to address that I think go along with vetting that you should keep in mind while you are doing this particular process. Number one, vetting is not the be all end all thing that you do when you're looking for a potential play partner. Just like reading a resume is not the only thing that somebody does before they decide to hire somebody, at least most of the time anyways. Vetting is not the only step that you should do when you are thinking about playing with somebody and that goes for any sort of relationship, any level of commitment. Please do not skip over negotiations. Please do not skip over any sort of important things that need to be discussed about the scene itself. This is not meant to be used in isolation as the only determination of if you want to play with somebody or not. Think about it this way. If the vetting process is like reading the resume, you may read the resume, you may decide this person sounds great, let's actually give them an interview, that's the negotiation phase, or you may decide, no, this person doesn't really seem like a great fit, or actually it seems like they've lied about some things on their resume, let's go ahead and put them in a bin and move on to the next person. Then you do the negotiation, and then when you've actually decided to do the scene, that is when you've hired somebody to do the job. Good for you. But I wanted to add another note here, and that is about people who actually don't have any experience or people who don't have the right kind of experience for the type of scene that you're looking for. If you are in a situation where you at this particular moment are looking for a very particular type of scene, like maybe you really, really want to get into rope bondage and you've met somebody you're interested in, but oh, they don't do rope bondage at all, but they're a really, really awesome wax play top or they love electro play. Well, maybe they're not good, a good fit for this job, but maybe you have another position they could fill or maybe you'll think about them at another time when you've had this great need for rope bondage fulfilled. So don't just dismiss somebody because they don't have all of the exact qualifications that you're looking for. There are oftentimes, again, just like in the work world, a lot of situations where somebody is not good, a good fit for the job, but they're a good fit for a job. Now, Last point, again, like I mentioned, people who don't have experience or don't have references. This is not necessarily a reason to completely disqualify somebody from being a potential play partner. It's just more of a time when you maybe want to reevaluate your risk level or why you want to play with this particular person or sort of um, ratchet down what you're thinking about doing for a scene. It's particularly difficult for new or young dominants to get experience to actually, you know, be a play partner for a lot of submissives. And I'm gonna keep doing the job analogy and I'm sure you all hate this by now, but young dominants and uh, newer doms are very much like the recent college graduate. They're at one point very qualified for the job because hey, they've got that four year degree, but they also don't have the three years of experience that that resume is asking. They also don't have the three years of experience that that job posting is asking for. Well, just like you can totally apply for a job if you don't meet all of the qualifications, you can totally hire somebody to uh, you know, be your dominant for the evening, even if they don't have that experience yet. And I would actually encourage that if they otherwise seem like a pretty good partner because hey, you're cultivating a new dominant that can be a lifelong play partner for you. And then that gives you the opportunity to show them the community. And I don't wanna say like mold them into the dom you want them to be, but it just, 
going to be a very fulfilling experience as a submissive uh, to get that opportunity to show a dominant their dominant side, to go through the expiration of their dominance, of their sadism, of whatever it is that motivates them to being king. That can be very fulfilling. It's kind of like investing in a new hire who maybe didn't have the experience you're looking for, but hey, they're a real go-getter. <laughs> Please just kill me with the job analogies. I keep making them and I can't help myself. Anyways, that is what I would say if you want to actually play with somebody who doesn't have experience, do make sure you keep it within your own risk profile and what they are most interested in, or if they have limited experience, what that experience is. So if they're completely new or they're kind of new but don't really have a lot of stuff um, they've done before, just do things like, you know, a simple limited time spanking scene, a simple flogging, uh, maybe just doing some simple bondage or even potentially showing them how to do the things you want to do is very valuable and is giving them experience. Also going to, cl to classes together and, uh, you know, helping them in that way can be a good thing to do as well. It's just really about figuring out where your risk level is and how to, you know, conduct the play that you want to do uh, while staying in that risk profile. So, you know, just keep all of that in mind. If you guys have any questions, comments, concerns, please do let me know down below. If you want to see more videos like this, I do make them twice a week, so please subscribe if you have not already. If you want to support this channel and see more videos like this one, if you want to be involved in a lot of really great stuff that I've been working on, I do highly recommend you go to my Patreon. I will link it down below. That's Edie Lupine on Patreon. That is what makes videos like this possible. I would literally really not be able to do any of this if it wasn't for Patreon. I wouldn't be able to make as many videos as I do. I wouldn't be able to do live streams or photo shoots or anything like that. So thank you guys so, so much for those of you who are on Patreon. And if you're not, do check it out. Anyways, that is all I wanted to talk about today. So until I see you next time, hope you get rest of your day and a get rest of your week. Bye-bye. <laughs>